In the first place, I'm asked to repeat the difference between the data region and the target team distribute, so the kernel region. So what's the difference between this directive here and the directive we put around our nested loops, right? So these, the kernel itself, so the target team distribute directive with which we define our kernel, tells the compiler to, oh, that in the next place some operation will follow which should be performed on the GPU. So that, uh, that code should be compiled for the GPU and processed on the GPU. In contrast to that, the data region just tells the compiler, here is some data I someone later want to use on the GPU. So I need to allocate, to copy it there, maybe to copy back at the end. It just tells that data movement to do that. The advantage what we gain here in that example by defining the data region and also defining the second kernel down here, we have no more copying forth and back on each time we call our kernel here. So this kernel is called for each iteration, so we, the default case we have thousand times calling this iteration during the compute process, so thousand times this kernel here is called. So and without having these data region here, thousand times the data is copied to the GPU and at the end of the kernel the data is copied back. Now we introduce this data region and then we say at the beginning, okay, there is some data I need to copy to the GPU, there is some data I need to copy to the GPU and I need to copy back at the end of the data region and there is some memory I need to allocate since I want to use it within the lifetime of the kernel. Oh, the multiple kernels. And then we can act on these data having multiple kernels also within these data region and acting on these uh, data, right? So, you implemented that already? Who put that in his code? Who compiled it and got some feedback? Compiler one-time feedback? Yeah, many of you, me also, and what's the overall result? So, or what's the first thing you realized? It's faster, yeah. That's also what I realized. So, I put that also visually here, so that were my original data from the CPU version, I call that now version 2, so version 1a I did here was the one with the data scoping and now it's 20 times faster, something like that. So we saw a significant improvement of our code. We can also explain that? Yes, we can. I can show you. So, I messed up a bit with, the, with my file namings, but the last output is that one. I still have the Cray ACC debug flag set to T, so we get the runtime commentary out here again, and what we see is at the beginning of our data region here, we again copying some data to, to the GPU, so I have to change, you don't see what I see, so okay, starting here. 
So we again copying what's that? 44 megabytes to the GPU. 400. Yeah, right. Right. 400 megabytes to the GPU. We do our kernels, and if we have a closer look to all these data movements now, we see at the end of our kernels and the starting of the new kernel, we just do maybe some few bytes copying back, but mostly we copy nothing. So that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to reduce the data movement. And at the end, we should see that there's also the profiling output. But we should also see at the end of our data region, then we copying the huge part back. But in between, there's nothing copied. So actually, there are some more data copying. If we really have a close look to that, we will see it's not only copying at the beginning and the end. It's a bit more, but we will come to that in a second. So just on my slides here, I summarized that, what I already showed you. So at the beginning, you have some data movement to the GPU for each kernel iterations. We have then more or less no copying forth and back. But if we really inspect it detailly, we see that this copying to the GPU and back is called two times. But we will come to that in a second. I just have a summarized slide. So with the this, with this OpenMP or OpenACC port, we did two kernels implemented, one data region, so it's three directives within these 70 lines of code, and we got this huge improvement, right? So that's the first part of my presentation. Now we immediately go to the second part. So just, you know, to remind you doing the same again. So yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe having a look to the profile again. I already have that file opened here. So, okay, let's see. Most time consuming part in our application is still data movement, right? It's still, I mean, it's drastically reduced, but still it's almost 40% of the runtime. Then there's some synchronization and then, um, yeah, the computation. I mean, that's where we want to spend our time in the computation. And maybe we can even do that better with better parallelization, but that's another story. So, I here compare the two profiles I have from the kind of old version and the new version. So we see from 88%, we go down. Uh, here it's 70%, so actually we went down to 30%. Uh, right, that's the one I did on the, the Kepler's GPU. Excuse me, I didn't update that one. Also summarizing that one. So we did the first kernel. We also introduced the data region. Now we want to move up the call tree. So we want to do more on the GPU and less on the CPU, right? And one thing why we want to do that or how we could realize that is that we could see that there is not only one data copying at the beginning and one at the end, but there's also some data movements in between. And that's why, that, excuse me, that's not why, that's because our code is structured like that, that we have a kind of initialization phase at the beginning where the Jacobi routine is called three times the iteration loop and then the actual computation routine where the Jacobi routine is called then these thousand times. So at, since we have 
define our data region here at the beginning of our Jacobi routine. The data movement is done once here and again here. Right? So defining another data region which is on top of that, so including both calls here of Jacobi, we could even reduce that data movement. That's what I would like to ask you now to do. Pre-iteration, it's a warm-up phase or? Uh, we have to do, do that to get kind of reference. Yeah, right. That's the, that's the main routine here. That's the Jacobi routine. We have already the data region within the whole Jacobi routine, right? We have already the iteration loop within our data region, but now we move it up the call tree to the main routine. I mean, could be also, I mean, if you have more complex code, you would not go directly from your computation routine to the main routine, but you go step by step, right? But here we have just uh, a call stack of two, size two, right? So we go one level up, which is the main routine in that case, and there we define our data region around these two calls of Jacobi routine. Unless we have the region. No, we can let this data, this data region in there since the same like defining uh, data movement in the kernel, so in the target team distribute. If the data is already on the GPU, it's using that one. So I would again suggest leaving that data region in here. I mean, removing that would just create more work overhead for you, right? And in, in that way, you also be on the safe side if you want to call Jacobi routine, for example, from another place of your application where you did not put the data region on. Then it's using that, excuse me, then it's using that data region. And how about the scopes of the variables? So if we put it outside of Jacobi definition, then all this ABC should be also declared before we write right. it. So it wouldn't work if actually A would be defined inside of Jacobi. Right. Okay. Then it's again. But I mean here, in that example anyways, we use ABC as an I mean we use these values to compute our result, right? So ABC is initialized before with some values. If it's initialized within um, um, let's say it's initialized here before the data region but within the Jacobi routine and you define your data scoping within that data region here within Jacobi, it's using that one. Then it's copying the data here when you call Jacobi. Then you do not need to define it here. You could, I mean, you could separate your variables completely. I mean, you could do define a data region for area A, which is defined on that place, and area B, which is defined on that place, and then somewhere down in the call tree, you define maybe also C, D, and F, which is then defined there, and then call the kernel for all of them. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, aren't we cheating ourselves a little bit? Because now we're not timing the data movement anymore, no? Excuse me? Aren't we cheating ourselves a little bit? Because now the data movement is also the timing. So we still do it, but we don't time it. <laughs> right, of that timing. But this is this timing here, excuse me, this timing here is just for 
measuring then the performance of this application. This is independent from what we do for profiling. So, yes, from, from an application point of view, if you just measure the timing within your application, it's kind of cheating, maybe. But, I mean, we anyways do profile the whole application and therefore it's no, I mean, not cheating. Okay, maybe a more serious question. Uh, one thing I didn't, um uh, that's not clear to me yet. So we start the kernels with the, um, uh, with the what was it, distribute, uh, teams distribute, right? Target teams distribute, yes. Yeah. Um, do we, uh, does it make any difference or do, uh, obviously we don't have to, but can we write parallel four after it or? That's a good question. No, no, when, when we start the kernel. So right now we write target teams distribute. I think it would make no sense, but I'm not sure if it's any way possible to do that. Because what I, what I try to do is I try to uh, explicitly collapse it, which then required me to write parallel four, and then I thought, what happens if I just leave out the collapse? And no, actually, you can do the nothing, collapse. We, I will changed. show you tomorrow. You can do the collapse statement for the loops, but you do not need to do a parallel four for that. Ah, it's okay. also acting with that distribution of the loops. And anyways, you do, you tell the compiler you want to distribute all the loops with our parallelization on the GPU. So it's the compiler is already aware that these loops should be distributed. So mentioning again, I want to distribute the loops makes no sense for me. So it's redundant then. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there a, a, so for the data transfer between CPU and GPU, is there a big overhead to also transferring small data, or it's just linear on the size of the data? I mean, if you have a lot of small data, yes, it no, no, sums up. I mean, if I have uh, no data at all, uh, just tiny, tiny datum to, to, to transfer, or a fairly bigger one, where is the big step between the tiny and the big? or from no data to the very tiny data? No, I would say from the tiny to the big. So okay. transferring a small portion of data takes a small amount of time. Okay, it's transferring not like a, a lot of data. Transfer and it causes a big overhead. Excuse me? Uh, it's not that it stops everything to transfer and causes a big overhead. No, anyways, I mean, when you start the, the kernel or the, I mean, we're just talking about kernels right now, right? Uh, the data region is something different. But if you start the kernel anyways, they start synchronal, synchronized together. So, they are, I mean, if you yeah. copy data before, it needs the time to copy the data. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, w so the question was actually, when it is worth it to um, micro-optimize all the small data inside a a, a loop so like here for example I was thinking about the uh, how it's called uh, I mean at the end there's a, a really practical answer to that you could have a profile of your code and if you see there's no time spent in data copying or almost no time you do not have to care about that yeah. if you see that's a significant portion of your runtime you should care yeah, okay. Before that, I wouldn't, I mean, if you have five arrays and I wouldn't take care about that unless you really see, okay, moving that data, that takes a significant time. So you basically have to do it one by one and seeing. No, I mean, if you know, okay, you have five arrays which are more or less the, the same size and my crucial part of the runtime is data movement, you could move them all five. I mean, if it's the same for you typing five arrays instead of one, yeah, I would move them all to data region. 
somewhere else. Right. Okay. Yeah, just to add my feeling on that, I think the question is like you're trying to parallelize with what is happening with network and MPI. It's when you transfer small things, it's 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 a bad idea instead of aggregating this and transferring a large part, right? Because there is a barrier for each. Yeah, because there there is the payload that you every packet in the network has to to put here. I think I mean in, even in small. There might be a small overhead because, I mean, at some point the kernel has to be involved, so as to set up the DMA to the to the to the card. But it's not like in MPI. And then you have also a small overhead when you launch a kernel. But it's it's minimal in the new yeah. in the new GPUs. I would take care about that. Because when you launch a kernel, it copies the arguments of the kernel to and sets up the threads, the blocks, etc., to the GPU. To do this in C plus in C, we need to put the region between the beginning and the end in the curly brackets. So how do we specify it? Because excuse me, you can create another structural block in C C plus plus curly bracket. Right, then you just create your data region and it's immediately collapsing. Yeah. yeah. Right, excuse me, I forgot that. Should mention that next time. I guess I have a problem with more with Fortran than with this, but I don't see why we define anything with A, B, C, B, and D work one in the main program when it's only used in a subroutine. So kind of the main program does not know anything about these variables? Yeah, I mean, some of the variables are initialized in the initialize routine here in front of that. We'll take care about that in a second. Oh, okay. But I mean, that's, that's always a question how your application is structured, yes. I mean, you so all these variables are already called in init empty. No, I, I just didn't see wh why, wh why we should use these variables when they are not used at all in the... Yeah, they're somehow thing. initialized. They could be also initialized like, you know, 10, 15 or some meaningful values. And mm -hmm. That's the question what your application is about. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, there is some initialization, so... I just didn't see this. And why do we not do anything with um, the GOSA and NN? Excuse me? Why do we not do anything with GOSA and NN? Uh, GOSA is treated within the kernel. We still have the reduction clause for GOSA, right? We always want an update at the end of our kernel. Excuse me. Let me go back to that one. So, Gosa we treat here. Where's my mark? There. We still treat there. So we update that one after each kernel, and we, I mean, want to get it back every time. I mean, depending on how you use your variables, you could also say, okay, I'm. I'm not interested in Gosa until the end of the Jacobi routine, then you could also move it up in the data region. Yes, you could also do that. I didn't do that in my example, but would be fine. And NN, or like other variables like SS and Omega? Um, yeah, SS and SCO and these variables, I mean, they are anyways just temporarily variables for that kernel. So we do not need to initialize that or... So they are now on GPU already because the rest of this part is on GPU? This is just scratch memory on the G GPU. Or registers. Or registers, yes. Okay. <laughs> 
correct me if I'm wrong, at least in OpenC, those var the scalar variables are first private or private. So mm -hmm. that means that, for example, the SS there is a, it's a scalar variable, it's not an array. Right. So when, when the compiler sees that thing, then uh, he automa he, it, it is implied that up there there is a private SS on the top. OMP target teams distribute, there is also additional clauses that the compilers the compiler understand. I mean, supposes, and so SS is private, which basically means that it is a register. So, yeah, yeah. So, it, excuse it, me, excuse me. It, Maybe going one step back. Yesterday, I, I told, talked about data scoping, right? And we can define the scoping for all the variables. But if we knew, if we do not define the scoping, the compiler will do it by itself with the default one. So arrays are by default shared, scalar, depending on which version you use, or shared or first private, and so on. So they are, they are, there is memory on GPU allocated and maybe also data copied anyways. If you want to change that, like here we, we want to say, okay, we have some arrays, we know we just need to copy to the GPU or we just need to copy back, or it's just we don't want to have any copy operation for a scratch array. Then we define it here. I mean, you can also define that for all the other variables if you want. You can also define it for S, SS, and S0, and so on. But that's not necessary. I mean, for the one where it's really clear what's the default one, then maybe it's nicer from a pro programming point of view to just leave them. If not, maybe it could be quite messy your code if you have, you know, data scoping which are 100 lines long. I think also regarding your first question, it's not necessary that all the array variables need be global. So in your, in functions, it's basically the compiler has a, a present table which knows which pointers or which actual arrays are present on the device. So when you get into a function and you say, even if you have map to, or I mean copy to, or copy from, then the, comp the runtime will check that whether this pointer or this array variable is on the device and will not copy it. So it just checks a pointer at the point, looks up a pointer and lookup table. So it's not necessary that all your arrays are global. So did you do that already? Who of you could not do that within time now? I mean, in that case, we do not want to, uh, or we do not need to have p back, since we are just interested in our Goza variable, we do not need to copy it back, yes. If you need the results of p at the end, yeah, sure, you should copy it back. So if it was a real life problem, we would have uh, OMP back uh, from... Yeah, maybe for p, maybe in our um, example, you would maybe copy work to back or whatever, yes. I mean, that really depends on your example. So can we just compare performance again? So I'm getting 34 gigaflops, but I think you're considerably more than that. You're up above 80. So 93, what actually. 80, well, looks like 89 <laughs> or 90. Uh, that's great for you. Um, what do you think the difference is? Excuse me? What do you, is the difference between yours and, for example, mine? I don't know. You you should tell me. You know what I did. I don't know what you did. My target was identical. Uh, the optimization part in there. No. Eighty-four. 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 E
No. No. Should be quite similar, but I mean. What do you mean with the second map? Well, I, I never bothered to put them in because I. <laughs> Which one? That step. Um, you mean the, the ones, ones in at the Jacobi, beginning of the Jacobi routine? The ones in Jacobi, but looking at the ACC debug, it's realizing those are present and it says zero bytes, eight bytes transfer. Yeah, yeah. So that should be fine. So that should be fine. I mean, the only okay. thing I can imagine what that's what we see with all real life application also that compilers doing different things. I mean, they have, you know, not, not if they have the same options. They're not, they're doing the same thing. They do. Okay. They do maybe different optimization. No, I'm, I'm using CC 8.5. Ah, you also also use CC. Yeah, yeah, I thought I you back. used PGI. Yeah, no. So then, uh, no, I don't know. Not for opening. So okay. what's the performance of all the other ones here? Same like me or same like him? Oh, then. Thousand. Yeah. No, it is thousand by default. Oh. Still ninety two. So let's see in my code. I did it here before. We have here in the main loop it's defined, I'm pretty sure. Oh no, also in my case it's hundred. Excuse me, I messed it up. So hundred is fine. <coughs> Anyways you got the same uh goes out so that should be also. But you get the same checksum, so the same goes out? I actually get 94. Excuse me? I actually get 94. Yeah, I mean, that could vary a little bit. So I mean, mean, that could be also maybe 90, maybe 95. But my GOSA, my GOSA is also smaller. What do you mean with small? <laughs> it's 0.75 times 10 to the minus 3. So well? the the Goza, I thought you checked at the beginning that the Goza is more or less the same like that. It could vary here at the end a bit. That's I'm fine with that. If yes. your Goza vary from the magnitude or here with the the real value, that could be a sign that you messed up something. So yes. if that doesn't it's completely different. <laughs> Then maybe you have an issue with the reduction of your Goza. Okay. So that should be the first thing you should compare. That really, that one is at least similar to the to your reference one. I mean, if you get wrong results, who cares about the performance calculating something wrong? Wait, 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 one second. In the, in the profiling statistics, um, yes. I'm a bit confused with the table here because it says. Wait, one, I, I open also that one. Uh, should rename my file. So you mean that one? Right? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, for me, it is the copy, ACC copy is just dash dash. There is no 424.18 there on the, on the top line at 174. You mean you have dashes here? Yeah. And zero. So you have practically no copy? No. Not at 174. I have it at 148, well, which is 153 for you. 
then maybe we should check your codes. I don't know. I mean, but if everything you else is the same. The GoSa and the flops. I mean, th that's the size of the data you copy, right? And that's what we also saw in the in the runtime commentary. But I mean, since that one. 174? No, I have to check again, excuse me. But the, the funny thing There's is. 74 is. 174. That's the one in the main routine, right? So actually. All ah, right. Excuse me, you now. Okay, you now looking at the profile from. That case, right? Where we yes. move the data region within the main routine above the Jacobi calls. Okay, that's yeah. different than what I saw here. That my profile was from the version before. Sorry. So yeah, the one. Chup chup chup. I need to go to there. So this line for me here, so 174, is the one within the Jacobi routine. So that you do not have to copy there anything, that's fine. I mean, okay. we move the data region above. Yes. yes. But, you but should see still some data movement then on the line in the main routine. I do, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. do I have do, that I do. here. Yeah. But then why is that increased to 39.7%? It, I mean, I, I have the same kind of increase here without any data. It's increasing. Okay, now we have to differentiate. So in the first column, we have the relative time for each of these, let's say, functions or data copying or whatever. So for each of these parts of our code. Um, <clears throat> sure, if we would use data copying, the portion of computation should increase, right? If we have our, our overall runtime, and at the beginning where we had a lot of data copying, we used a lot of our runtime for data copying, just a small portion for computation. Now we will remove the data copying part, the portion of computation should increase. So the relative time should change. And that's at the end. That's also the thing where you, as a as a programmer, applying these applica optimization, should take care of. I mean, since the, the the portion changes, and your interest should also change. So at the end, if you see, okay, that function where I started with optimizing, now just take a small part of time, right? But the now function maybe now takes a much larger portion of my one time. I should investigate in that one then. So, I agree, but okay. the 39% is against, so everything else is zero and there are dashes, and then 39% is for the copy. Is this so my, my confusion is, is the host time percentage an accumulation of what has happened, what is below in the tape? Because I don't understand why if it is zero in ACC time, then the host time should be increased to 39% in my table. Uh, I would guess that this is just kind of an error since our overall runtime is so small. I mean, my application here runs now within 0 0.73 seconds, we have an, yeah. um, we just see here on two digits. So, you know, if the, the portion of runtime is less than 0 0.01 second, nine seconds, then we do not see that here. Okay. So if you want to see that, I mean, Maybe in our case we could increase the the amount of iterations, so increasing that from 
hundred iterations to thousand iterations. I mean, in your real application, you anyway should use a rep representative uh, uh, test case. So even in in problem size, but also in kind of runtime. I mean, it's not worth doing that with a 24 hours run, but if it's too small like that, yeah, you see, yeah, we have problems to really analyzing that in detail. Yeah, that's a good point. Is this also why we... why we are still mainly copying data and not the computation? Because we do quite a less a few computations on that, yeah, right. So it seems like now we optimized already, but still. Yeah. So our test case with just a few operations on the data is now not representative anymore, I would say, yes. Good point. Excuse me, can you? The first time it is copied um, in the main function, the increase in host time percentage is about 3%. What do you mean, the increase of? Uh, oh, I mean, it is 8.7% 8 8 .7 for me. The, the, the second time you see the ACC copy in the table. So I don't see why there it should be only 8.7%, whereas at the top of the table it is 37.5%, <coughs> whereas the time is zero. ACC time is zero. Okay, now to remove all confusions, I would like to do my test case a bit larger and then we hopefully can analyze it better, right? Okay, so give me one second. Um, So, are you confident? No. So, is it like that, what you see? Similar to that, I mean, now I increased it by a factor of 10, so I did 1,000 operations, but you now we see here some timings, but that's what you mentioned, right? That you do not see any data movement there, right? So, this is because the ACC copy on deadline, and I guess deadline is the one within the Jacobi routine, is called quite often. So we call that 2,000 times now, in my case. So it's called quite often, therefore it has some kind of overhead, but the actual data movement down here with the large arrays we define in the main function with the data region there, that takes just 1% of our runtime. It's quite a lot of data, but spending quite a few of the time. That data movement here is just because we still have some few bytes left copying in and out on each kernel or within the data region since we did not move out every data in the outermost data region. 
And since we have some data left, it's copying that data quite often. It might, it's here 2,000 times. So we spend some time on that. Could also optimize that one, right? Good point. And I have the impression that changes now with Pascal. I think I, on Tesla I wasn't at that behavior. Pretty sure. But okay. Um, How do you compute that percentage of 45.5? Just want to understand the... No, the, the percentage here in the first column, oh, where's my pointer? That percentage here, yeah. that's the overall runtime. No, it's not. Right. Um, that's a good question, actually. I think it's the, not the overall runtime, but the time spent on host. I'm pretty sure it's that one. I mean, the relative time spent for that routine, for that function, uh, with respect to the total time spent on the host. You can, I'm pretty sure, you can also change the metric. I'm not, I had to check. Uh, which option we have to use. We could also do a, a patch report on that file, so that's an AP2 file here, with some special options like minus capital O, and then we want to change relative times here, so representation of the metric we use. We can change that to act differently on the data, yes. We could do that. So I think he had asked the question before, the the host time is not in seconds, right? The host time should be also in seconds, yes. Should be all in seconds. Okay. But then it's the um, exclusive host time, so all the time you spend computing on GPU is not uh, considered as host time. Okay. So here you see we spend my mouse now? we spend 1.4 seconds on the GPU, right? So which is the most part of overall of our overall runtime, and just 0 0.04 seconds additionally on the host, doing in that case initialization and printing out stuff and. But then the summation of that is not 1.9. It's not exactly the overall runtime. Yeah, that's a good point. There's some time hidden. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Yes. I did. Was not enough. That's already a thousand iterations. Not all together. <laughs> ah. Also good point. We can also try that one. So maybe even more. No, I stay with that. So what's the default? Six four three, and but there's just six four five. Yeah, it's just six. Okay.
still running. So we increase the runtime. Excuse me? The slides again, okay. That one or the result, we can also go. Any more questions? So maybe that's why I didn't increase that so much. Now I have to wait. can have a look to the output then later I would suggest maybe going one step further right so I mean even if our profiling is maybe not that accurate anymore since our runtime is so small I would say it's still representative and um, what I wanted to ask you forgot that excuse me All right, that was my next step. I wanted to do it not with more iterations, but with a larger problem size. You could also do that. So now I, I increase the cycles of iterations now, right? What we also could do, we could increase the size of our matrix or tensor. I mean, that's always, I mean, if you have to consider that in your real-time application, you have to think of what's, what's a real, realistic example. There you should better know how to tune your code. So that's what you maybe could do. So increasing the problem size. So there's a compile option I said in the make file just using problem size. You can select between one, two, three, and four. They are fixed sizes, four fixed sizes of the matrix. And then again, we need a reference number at least for um, our checksum here to compare it with that. And maybe also for the performance. And then we want to apply that with our um, OpenMP parallelization or OpenACC parallelization. So I will also do that one here in parallel. Excuse me? Yes. When we increase the iterations number, should we, do we expect to see that actual calculation will be taking the most time and not data copying? Excuse me? Uh, so I now used uh, 100,000 iterations. It ran three minutes. Mm -hmm. But I still see that data copying is 79% uh, of. I mean, we still have this small portion of data copying, at least of the GOSA, back at each at the end of each kernel, right? That, now in that case, sums up to a significant part, yes. 
You could also so try to get rid of that. I mean, that's the question. Do you really need that data afterwards? I mean, do you need the data at the end of each kernel? Or where do you need the data? Could you also move that one data region up? Yes. So you could also try to move the remaining data in a data region up the call tree, and then that should reduce also the portion of the data copying. Mm -hmm. But for what we did, it is not unexpected. It's no, fine. it's not unexpected. That's a good point. You should try that. You want to optimize, right? Did all the slides? Which solution? Excuse me? For that one, I use the same version. I want to do one more optimization with you together. But I would like to do that in a second. Just need to submit my job here. So yes, you're right. That's what you also saw, right? I increased the iteration to, what was that? 10,000, 10,000, I think. So now we see, okay, there is, there is also timing for that. There's really time spent on copying, but still the copy with integer copy routine takes a significant portion since we do it 200,000 times would be a good point to really get rid of that. So that's a good exercise, doing that. But I would like to do one more thing with you first. In our case, you can get rid of that, since we actually need no data within our uh, Jacobi routine, we do not need any data back. We just need it back when we finish the Jacobi routine and be back in the main routine. Then we need the data back, but that's, I mean, this data copy here is done within the Jacobi routine, right? We do it 200,000 times, so it's 200,000, I mean, it's done for each kernel. And that's what we actually should be able to get rid of in that example. I mean, in our applications, maybe you are not able to get rid of that. Then you need maybe to concentrate on something else. Can you show that later about the viewer? Yeah, we can do that later. I just would like to do the our example first. Um, so, Right, I also increased the problem size. And what I got is that for different problem size, so I increased the metrics, I even get a bit speed up. So it, the application performs uh, a bit better since the, we have much more loop iterations to distribute on our GPU and that, I mean, that's, that's a really crucial point. I mean, there where you, this is the point where you really have to think of starting doing GPU when you have a lot of loop iterations, a lot of work to do, same kind that you can put on the GPU. But still, beside of the data movements, we can do that. Um, another things I would like to take care of, so um, 
Yeah, further optimization, so we can tune the data movement again. We will do that in a second. We can also vary the problem size, but this depends on your real application example, if this is really worthwhile doing that. Then we could also think of re advanced loop scheduling, especially if you have um, very different loop boundaries. So if you maybe have small loops in big loops or big loops and small loops and so on. But we will talk about these topics tomorrow in more detail. And there you can tune these loop scheduling with tuning clauses also varying the fat blocks and also do it the collapsing which we mentioned shortly. And just to summarize steps until here, so we we put four open MP kernels, right? Um, with six directives and we got quite a good speed up. So I think I missed one thing. Give me one second. Right. I didn't realize that we jump over one step. So what I did then afterwards, so now we moved, we moved our data region here around our two cores of the Jacobi routine, right? But still, it's not the whole application reported on the GPU. There is still the initialization left, which is done on the CPU. And that's also the reason why we have to copy quite a lot of, quite a huge amount of data, neglecting all the small parts, which is speeding up our time. But I also would like to include that one within our data region. So what we have to do for that is just moving the data region also above that initialization routine, then since we initialize all values within that routine here, we can just uh, scope them as just allocate, so it's just memory we have to allocate on the GPU. But since we also want to perform the initialization on the GPU, we have to define also kernels for these initializations. So in these init TM, routine, we need to define kernels to act on the data on the GPU. So when we did that, I mean, the point is if you move up the call tree with your data region, everything which is within the call tree, you have to perform on the GPU and therefore you have to write kernels. So you have to do the directive around the, your computation there, or you have to synchronize the values to the GPU, uh, to the CPU to act on the CPU on that data, right? So that you ha should keep in mind. And with that optimization, just to cut here, I then got a slightly more speed up compared to the one where we did not include the, um, the initialization. But what would happen if we do not uh, put kernels into the initialization? So if, if you would move up the call tree here with your data region and do not define the, the directives here around the loops. This will be performed on the CPU, so it will act on your data on the CPU and your data on the GPU stays uninitialized.
Right, you really have to pay attention what you are doing with your memory within your data region. So if you increase the size of your data region, you really have to take care about what's happening in between. Right, that's the point. So, are there more questions to that? I mean, then if not, I would just finalize that session. We could keep on working on that example, but maybe at least for the recording, we could finish here. So, I almost did it. Just wanted to say, okay, that we um, didn't change the one slides there. So we got quite a good improvement with our port here. And <clears throat> just to summarize with our data region, we got yeah, 22 times speed up, even more kernel tuning. What we could even do, I mean, if we investigate everything with our data movements and data region, and maybe also with the loop scheduling then later on, Far, far away, there could be then a low-level implementation of the kernel in Kula. But that's nothing I, I want to do here. And, oh yeah, that was the last slide. So, hopefully we could also fix the data movement issue. And, yeah, then could go on with our examples. Questions?
questions to that exercise? I want to ask, so the number of uh, threads that will be running on GPU we do not control, it's given by the GPU. We don't know I mean how many threads How many threads will be. are spawned? Yeah. I mean, that's actually controlled by, I'm pretty sure that's defined by the compiler, which knows that since you specify kind of indirectly using the modules which hardware you want to use. So yes. we load the Scrape ESL NVIDIA 60 module, right? This tells the compiler, okay, we have that hardware, or we want to compile for that hardware, which implies that you can do a certain distribution of your work. Because when I run just usual OMP, I can say that I want 10 threads when I submit the job. And here I cannot do that because I, I looked you, in, in our yeah, submission yeah, okay. that, that, script and it okay, says that's one another thread. story. We can do that tomorrow. That's about loop scheduling. There you can really say how many thread blocks I want to create, how many threads within the flat thread block I want to create, and so on. You can specify that one. If you you want. specify this in the pragma or at the submission time? No, you specify that in the pragma. Not the submission time. That's different then. Because our submission okay. script actually says. Uh, num threads equals one. Yeah, that's for the host, uh, M the open MP host parallelization. Mm -hmm. You could also do that in host parallelization and GPU, but that's a different story. I mean, you could also parallelize it with MPI and GPU or MPI, open MP, host open MP and GPU. But yeah. So what, what if we have the situation when I have part of my code that is uh, CPU parallelized with OMP? Mm -hmm and part of my code which uh, I want to parallelize with GPU. Yes. So then I need to specify this on PNUM threads to whatever I wanted them and also yeah. have the GPUs and this will work. I mean, the loop scheduling, so how many threads and thread blocks you want to have on your loops partitioned to, you specify on the OpenMP target teams distribute and then you specify it there. So that's really independent from OpenMP num threads. That's how you distribute it. Another story is if you want to add both parallelization, yeah, yeah. so host OpenMP and GPU OpenMP <sighs> parallelization, usually you start with the host OpenMP I mean, assuming you already have your OpenMP, host OpenMP parallelization, and you want to port some parts on the GPU, exactly. you can then do a compiler if dev GPU, then do my target teams distribute, else do parallel, parallel do, and if, and then the loop is coming. So that the compile or that you can decide during Compile time, okay, I have some GPUs available, so I compile these with the kernels for the GPU. Otherwise, I compile everything for just host and open MP parallelization. And I guess I need to make sure that at the time I arrive at the GPU part of the code, it's only one CPU thread that executes there. Well, in the sense that it's not a uh, CPU parallel region. You cannot do GPU inside of parallel CPU region. Maybe you shouldn't do. I mean, I, at least I don't care you if you can, but. Do, or you <laughs> really have to take care about your memory. I think you principally you could do. Uh, yeah, and probably not very useful. I mean, it depends on. If you have memory, I mean, parts of your memory, some variables, you just act on the CPU and other parts you act on the GPU and you are really careful about synchronizing these parts which are used on both, for example, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you act on 
on one huge array on the CPU and then another part on GPU, you have, you have to be really careful that there's the synchronization between the threads and so on, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to follow up on your question about threads. Generally on GPUs you can you cannot know or you cannot specify the exact amount of threads in total that you're going to run. Even in CUDA. The only the only thing you can specify is how many threads a block will have. Okay. A block will go or and run on a single assembly. And there might be multiple blocks active. So I mean multiple <coughs> threads, multiple blocks running at the same time, but the exact amount of threads has, has to do with, for example, what's the iteration space that you go, that is partitioned. So for example, if you, you have a one million elements and you have, uh, I mean, then you will have one, you may have also one million threads or I mean, depending on how you split it. On the on the block. So if it's if it's thread takes an iteration to perform. So it's not the idea is not like open and be go with ten threads and go that. Yeah, but it's true Yes, there is a maximum, and that's <coughs> you don't have to care. Yeah, it's up to then to the compiler to to decide and how it will it will perform it. But. I mean, usually the compilers know a good parameter for setting up, a, a good initial starting, starting point for the blocks, depending on the architecture, because it doesn't matter if you, uh, usually a good number is 128 and 256, that most of them they're using. Uh, because if you go larger, you may reduce the uh, utilization of the GPU. Uh, if you go less, again, you might not fill it up. So, but if you see that you have impediments from your Profiling, then you can tune this parameter. It's not like a priori; you have to tune it. Just for comparison, do we have the OpenMP host version somewhere? I'm, I know it's out there on the internet, but do you have solutions uh, for these exercises? OpenMP host, Open. MP, I'm pretty sure GPU, that is in ACC, the repository, GPU. not in the exercise it's in the directory, repository. but there's. Right. So, oh, so I need to change. So, okay, my screen is not large enough. So there's the OpenACC training exercises Cray, and then we now worked in Himeno, but there's also the Himeno prepared. And there is also the ACC, OpenACC version. There's also an OpenMP host parallelized with an OpenMP thread parallelized version, and then there's also a version with MPI. That should be in master, yes. So this is then in... Exercise we've been working on the whole morning. If we want to run that then just on a CPU system, what do we need to change? Something just some some flags on the on the make file for the compiler or well, just on a CPU system. You just yeah. disable OpenMP, then you run it in serial. No, uh, still uh, still running it in parallel, but 
Mm, no, it's then running in serial. Yeah. And if you want to run it in parallel, there is the Himeno prepared direct. So you see, I'm now yeah, but, in but the Cray Himeno Fortran version, right? And two levels up. Yeah, but so the version we've been prepared now is not portable then. The version we, okay, the version we used, let me have a look in that. Now, there it is. The version we used, right, there is no other OpenMP statement in there beside of what we added. Yeah, that's true. So there is no host OpenMP parallelization included so far. Yes. If you want that, there is a pre-prepared version, a pre-prepared version, which is it, it, two it, levels up, uh, Himeno prepared, yes. C or Fortran. Oh no, in C version, it's just a, okay, it's just for the Fortran version. There's also Fortran OpenMP okay, and version. So is it? So if I want a CPU host, I mean version and the GPU version within one code file, then yes. I would need a lot of if dev statements. Depend if you oh. want to have your code portable for architectures with and without oh. GPUs. Yes. yes, then you need if statements to say, okay, I have that loop and in case I have a GPU, I want to use the target directive, and if not, I want to use the normal Paolo do, yes. But with OpenACC, uh, and at least for the PGI compiler, you can, the same directives may generate code also for the multicore. If you just, so we have the same directives, what, not OpenMP, I'll show uh, you later about OpenACC. So you may have like uh, ACC parallel loop, and if you specify the command line that uh, interpret the OpenAC directives and generate code for multicore, then you will get uh, code for multicore. Actually, so I have to correct there. myself. There's also for the Cray compiler a compiling flag, compiling flag using or telling the compiler if you have GPU accelerated OpenMP directives in there just using host OpenMP parallelization with that. I do not now remember what's the actual compiler flag with that. I guess it's just available in the newer version of the CCE, so CCE 8.6, but that's just a guess. We have to double check that. But then you could write your OpenMP, maybe also both OpenMP host parallelization, OpenMP GPU parallelization code, and then tell the compiler, okay, I have just CPU is available, and it compiles for that. Yeah. I will do it in a second. Some more? Uh, he's just discussing that. Mandis? Yes. So in the prepared version of Fortran Himeno, which mm. file is the is the one just for CPU parallelization? So because I checked the latest the last version, V04, and it has uh, target team distribute, so target teams distribute. So I I think there's only so you check the Fortran or the C F, version? The, the F, Fortran. Yeah. I think there's only, uh, we don't see that here, there's only uh, OpenMP, OpenMP version, right? That, that one, right? So that seems to be a combination of both. Yeah, that's a combination of both. So I think we do not provide an example with only CPU um, OpenMP implementation.
Yeah, that means OpenMP host parallelization, OpenMP target parallelization. That's why it's OpenMP, OpenMP. More data region, which is on top of that, so including both calls here of Jacobi, who could even reduce that data movement. That's what I would like to ask you now to do. Pre-iteration, it's a warm-up phase or? Uh, we have to do, do that to get kind of reference. Yeah, right. That's the that's the main routine here. That's the Jacobi routine. We have already the data region within the whole Jacobi routine, right? We have already the iteration loop within our data region, but now we move it up the call tree to the main routine. I mean, could be also, I mean, if you have more complex code, you would not go directly from your computation routine to the main routine, but you go step by step, right? But here we have just uh, a call stack of two, size two, right? So we go one level up, which is the main routine in that case, and there we define our data region around these two calls of Jacobi routine. And that we have to remove? No, we can let this data, this data region in there since the same like defining uh, data movement in the kernel, so in the target team distribute. If the data is already on the GPU, it's using that one. So I would again suggest leaving that data region in here. I mean, removing that would just create more work overhead for you, right? And in, in that way, you also be on the safe side if you want to call Jacobi routine, for example, from another place of your application where you did not put the data region around. Then it's using that, excuse me, then it's using that data region. And how about the scopes of the variables? So if we... Since I want to use it within the lifetime of the kernel. Oh, the multiple kernels. And then we can act on these data, having multiple kernels also within these data region and acting on these uh, data, right? So, you implemented that already? Who put that in his code? Who compiled it and got some feedback? Compiler runtime feedback? Yeah, many of you, me also, and what's the overall result? So, or what's the first thing you realized? It's faster, it's faster yeah. That's also what I realized. So, I put that also visually here. So that were my original data from the CPU version. I call that now version two. So version 1A I did here was the one with the data scoping and now it's 20 times faster, something like that. So we saw a significant improvement of our code. We can also explain that. Yes, we can. I can show you. So, I messed up a bit with, the, with my file namings, but the last output is that one. I still have the Cray ACC debug flag set to two, so we get the runtime commentary out here again, and what we see is at the beginning of our 
data region here. We again copying some data to, to the GPU. So I have to change right now. You don't see what I see. So okay, starting here. So we again copying, what's that? 44 megabytes to the GPU. 400? Yeah, right. right. 400 megabytes to the GPU. We do our kernels. And if we have a closer look to all these data movements now, we see at the end of our kernels and the starting of the new kernel, we just do maybe some few bytes copying back, but mostly we copy nothing. So that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to reduce the data movement. And at the end, we should see that there's also the profiling output, but we should also see at the end of our data region, then we copying the huge part back. But in between, there's nothing copied. So actually there are some more data copying. If we really have a close look to that, we will see it's not only copying at the beginning and the end. It's a bit more, but we will come to that in a second. So just on my slides here, I summarized that, what I already showed you, so at the beginning you have some data movement to the GPU for each kernel iterations. We have then more or less no copying forth and back. But if we really inspect it detailly, we see that this copying to the GPU and back is called two times. But we will come to that in a second. I just have a summarized slide. So with the these, with this OpenMP or OpenACC port, we did two kernels implemented, one data region, so it's three directives within these 70 lines of code, and we got this huge improvement, right? So that's the first part of my presentation. Now we immediately go to the second part. In the first place, I'm asked to repeat the difference between the data region and the target team distribute, so the kernel region. So what's the difference between this directive here and the directive we put around our nested loops, right? So these the kernel itself, so the target team distribute directive with which we define our kernel, tells the compiler to, oh, that in the next place, some operation will follow which should be performed on the GPU. So that, uh, that code should be compiled for the GPU and processed on the GPU. In contrast to that, data region just tells the compiler, here is some data I someone later want to use on the GPU. So I need to allocate, to copy it there, maybe to copy back at the end. It just tells that data movement to do that. The advantage what we gain here in that example by defining the data region and also defining the second kernel down here, we have no more copying forth and back on each time we call our kernel here. So this kernel is called for each iteration. So we, the default case, we have thousand times calling this iteration during the compute process. So thousand times this kernel here is called. So, and without having these data region here, 
thousand times the data is copied to the GPU and at the end of the kernel the data is copied back. Now we introduce these data region and then we say at the beginning okay there is some data I need to copy to the GPU, there is some data I need to copy to the GPU and I need to copy back at the end of the data region and there is some memory I need to allocate So just, you know, to remind you doing the same again. So yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe having a look to the profile again. I already have that file opened here. So, okay, let's see. Most time consuming part in our application is still data movement, right? Still, I mean, it's drastically reduced, but still it's almost 40% of the runtime. Then there's some synchronization and then, um, yeah, the computation. I mean, that's where we want to spend our time in the computation. And maybe we can even do that better with better parallelization, but that's another story. So, I here compare the two profiles I have from the kind of old version and the new version. So we see from 88% we go down. Uh, here it's 70%, so actually we went down to 30%. Uh, right, that's the one I did on the, the Kepler's GPU. Excuse me, I didn't update that one. Also summarizing that one, so we did the first kernel. We also introduced the data region. Now we want to move up the call tree. So we want to do more on the GPU and less on the CPU, right? And one thing why we want to do that or how we could realize that is that we could see that there is not only one data copying at the beginning and one at the end, but there's also some data movements in between. And that's why, that, excuse me, that's not why, that's because our code is structured like that, that we have a kind of initialization phase at the beginning where the Jacobi routine is called three times the iteration loop and then the actual computation routine where the Jacobi routine is called then these thousand times. So at, since we have defined our data region here at the beginning of our Jacobi routine, the data movement is done once here and again here, right? So defining an 